You're listening to Behind the Wheels with Doug Mason, Dave Walters, and Mike Yeagley. This is a show where we talk about heavy truck and medium-duty accidents. Doug, Dave, and Mike bring close to 100 years of experience and expertise in the transportation business. Join us once a month to learn new things about accidents. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Wheels. I'm Mike Yeagley. I'm Doug Mason. And I'm Dave Walters. Today, we're going to be uh, tackling wheel balancing. It's uh, a lot of interest in the industry on this. Let's start out with some simple definitions. Uh, Doug, what is balance? Well, we'll try to make it as simple as possible. Balance is probably very easy, but people get confused between balance and run out because they both can create some of the same issues. So I'll try to just give a simple explanation of both of those just as we start here. A balance perspective, if you think about a wheel, and say it's perfectly round, but if there's more mass or something heavier on one side, obviously it'll tilt that way. So you're going to have an uneven mass distribution. And what that does is it creates a centrifugal force when it rotates, and that's what leads to the vibration. So that's really what they call an imbalance. You just have uh, more mass on one side than the other of uh, a disc, if you want to think of it that way, and you have to accommodate for that so that you won't have that centrifugal force creating a vibration. Whereas when you talk about a runout, you really have two types of runout that occur. You have a radial runout and a lateral runout. And try to give a little bit of explanation of that as well. Uh, I wish we could say our whole crowd really knew what records were, because that would be a really good way of doing it. But instead, we'll just say, we'll just say you have a... <laughs> They're not as old as us. Right. If you have a, a disc that is perfectly centered and you spin it, obviously you can put your finger right next to it and you would never touch it because it's perfectly centered. You can have a radial run out of a type where instead of that disc being perfectly round, it kind of is undulated. So although it's still in the same plane, uh, if you're standing next to it, you get hit by it every once in a while, right? Because you'd have a high spot and a low spot, so to speak. Hopefully, for those who have seen record players, if you take the record and shift it over to one side and you have the whole offset a little bit, it's not going to make a perfect circle. It's going to have that sort of an undulating or a, uh, an offset sort of thing where it's going to be high in one section and low in, in another. Okay, that would be type 2 radial runout. That's when you have an offset right. center. Type 1 rad uh, radial runout is when the actual outer diameter itself is not perfectly circular. So you have a high spot and a low spot. Although it's perfectly centered, you still have, I, I don't know if you want to call it potato chipping around the edge, maybe, as a way to think of it. So those are two types of runout that you can have. That's a type 1 and a type 2. And you'd imagine that with a wheel, you're going to have both. You're not going to be perfectly centered on the axis of the axle, and the circumference is not going to be perfectly round either. So that's where you get those two types of radial runout, and that will give you a high spot and a low spot as you're going down the road, so to speak. A lateral runout is almost easier to envision. Uh, a lateral runout is if you have a, a flat disc, a perfectly flat disc, and you spin it, it stays perfectly flat. You don't see anything wobbling. It's really what we're talking about is a wobble type effect. And so you can have, again, both types. You can have type 1, where the disc itself is like a potato chip, so it wobbles up and down no matter what. Or you can have it tilted. And if it's tilted, obviously, then you're going to have a high spot and a low spot as well from a lateral runout perspective. And that's more if you're going down the road, you'll see a wobble, right? You're going to wobble in and out, in and out, in and out as it's turning. And uh, radial runout, you're going to be going up and down, up and down, up and down. Maybe that's the best way to determine. So, Dave, when you have runout problems and you have balance problems, are there things that customers can, a fleet can look for just in the way the vehicle rides, the wheel wears? Is there something folks can be looking for to try and figure out what is what? Yeah, the rule of thumb in the field is runout is typically a ride issue. So if a driver comes back and says he's hopping, a lot of times it's more of a ride issue. Balance really gets into tire wear. If the tire's not wearing evenly, it's most of the time balance. Runout can do it, but runout's more of a driver saying, I got a hop or I got a shimmy or a, you know what I mean, I got a shake or something like that. So that's how they do it in the field. They really go to run out as typically ride issues. And when they get into tire wear issues, they will start looking for balance. 
Obviously, when you're diagnosing and you see that you have a tire wear issue uh, and you want to take a look at, well, am I imbalanced or not, there's a few different ways that can be taken a look at. You can look at it from a static perspective. People do a static balance. And that's really, if you think about it, you really only have a single plane of balance. You take a plate or the wheel, if you want to say, and it's balanced on a single point. If there's more mass to one side than the other, obviously it's going to dip. And you need to place mass on the other side to make it obviously balance out. And that would be a static balance. And, and that gets you somewhere, but you really need to move more toward a dynamic or even a non-vehicle spin balancing. And the good thing about the dynamic balancers, and Dave and I were just talking about this a minute ago, the machines that are out there now, you really don't even know, need to know how they work. You put them on there, you hit the button, and it says put this much weight on this flange and this much weight on this flange. And that's because when you do dynamic balancing, it's not just a single plane. Uh, or plate that it's trying to balance. And when it's spinning, it's actually balancing both planes, the in inboard and outboard flange, if you want to think about it that way. And then that allows you to have a much more uniform balance because you're able to put the balance away. It's exactly where they needed and the amount that's needed for each individual flange. So when you're talking about balance, uh, there is a difference between a steel and aluminum wheel. Dave, you want to tackle that one? When you look at the two a steel wheel versus an aluminum wheel. Aluminum wheel is basically a forged aluminum wheel, let's state that, which is what you're going to see in most of your class, you know, six, seven, eight. A forged aluminum wheel is going to have very little balance issues compared to a steel wheel. So in the field, people understand that. You know, like our wheel is close to zero as, as you can. And really what you know, it's it's odd, but where we put the valve stem in, you know, we tell them to put the dots there. The valve stem basically is going to be the heavy point of our wheel because the valve stem is a couple ounces. So, I mean, we're really true. So, I got a real funny story. I was over in Japan one time at a, you know, major OEM, and he's saying, uh, we have to use more wheel weights on your wheels. You know, what's up? And, I, and I'm like, yeah, you're going to have to use more wheel weights on our wheel because if the tire is 10 ounces out and our wheel's zero, you got to put 10 ounces on it. If the steel wheel's five ounces out and you got a tire out 10, if you mismatch it, you can get to five. So you're going to use a lot more wheel weights with aluminum wheels. And Just to compensate for the tires. Because of the tires. The tires is where most of the balance issue is. Mm -hmm. When we write all these TMC things, we understand that the tires is where most of the balance issue is. And the wheels are pretty true. But when you're mismatching them, you're really mismatching the high and the low spot to try to get them. You know, that's why these dots are so important to a lot of fleets because they just want to match up the dot against the valve stem, put them on and say, there, we're done. It's over. You know, we did the best we can. You know, these guys want uh, times money, maintenance costs. So, you know, just put on the dot and that's as good as it gets. So away we go. So you want to talk about on-vehicle balancing and off-vehicle balancing, Dave? Oh, I mean, that has been the talk. Most fleets will only ever balance the steers. When you do it on the vehicle, you know, you jack up the truck. You, you take a machine, you spin the tire wheel, but now also you're including, you know, the hub, the brake drum, your, you know, if you got disc brakes or whatever, you're including the whole axle in it. And then they balance it that way. It's a really a decision on, do I want to spend the cost of the machine? And every time I do this, I'm jacking up the truck. It takes more time to do it this way. But the people who say, hey, I pay more money for steer axle tires. I'm trying to get every ounce of mileage I can out of them. This is the way to do it. It's a great debate in the industry. And again, every fleet has their own idea. You can definitely get the whole wheel in balance that way. Yeah, and just I think we should step back just for a second. We keep talking about balancing. We're really talking about balance weights at this point, right? Uh, when we're talking about uh, doing a, a static or a dynamic or even an on-vehicle balance, it's to know where to put the wheel weight. That's going to be basically either a stick-on weight that adheres to the, the wheel or a clip or a knock-on weight, as they call it, that will attach to the flange the amount of weight that's needed, right? 
Right. That gets us into one of the things that Dave said just a moment ago that really caught my attention is that most fleets aren't balancing. He's, he mentioned, you know, they'll, they'll line up the dots and then off they go. They don't bother putting more weights on. They just want to have it as close as they can without having that extra effort. Other folks, they're uh, balancing on the vehicle. They're trying to really, you know, dial it in perfectly. And so there's this whole, call it a range of solutions out there. Dave, you want to talk a little bit about, from a fleet standpoint, what drives that one way or the other? It's really about tire life. When you talk to fleets, they'll tell you their number one cost is fuel, and then tires is number two. If you look at a fleet, anything to do with added fuel mileage and that is gigantic. So fuel is by far number one. The tires is number two. So here's your number two maintenance item on your vehicles. How are you going to get maximum tire life? And that's really where they're at. And every fleet has a different scenario. You know, a lot of them basically use the warranty. So they they, they buy a truck, they trade it off, they get a five-year, 500,000-mile warranty on the truck, and they want to trade that truck off in three to four years so they don't have to do any of the heavy maintenance. So they think of it different than a guy that's saying, I'm going to keep this truck for a long time. Again, the world is so different, so you just you don't have cookie cutters out there. You got Everybody has a different thought process, so it's really tire life. So they're looking at tire life. That's the number one thing the fleets want to do is tire life, casing life, because a lot of them is going to retread. Do they get two or three retreads out of the casing? And again, that all goes back to tire life. The fleet perception is another big part of it, Doug. You want to cover that one? Well, I was just going to make uh, some other comments here. Uh, the difference isn't why you would or wouldn't balance. I think, Dave, you and I talked about this before as well. If you're maybe an over-the-road fleet and you are very sensitive and you have a very good maintenance program, et cetera, et cetera, TMC has done studies that showed if you were, if you balance uh, the whole truck, you can get another 2 to 2.5% two fuel uh, efficiency improvement, which, as you said, is one of the main uh, drivers, obviously, for fleet costs. So there are certain fleets that are going to see that, have the ability to do it, and gain a benefit from it. But if uh, you're running a garbage truck or something like that, what's the use in, in, in really balancing at that point, right? So there's that may be another evaluation of the ends of the spectrum on, on who's looking to balance and why. You know, one of the things that I think about are like motorhomes. Basically, you have uh, just a regular folk driving you know, lots of miles on a motorhome, and they're going to feel every vibration, every shimmy that, that's on that vehicle, and they want to have the harmonics just dialed in. And so one of the things that they can do is add a little bit of weight. If you have a harmonic problem where you're getting a little bit of sound, you, you get in engineering, we would call it a modal a modal stress. It's it's where basically your, your axle end starts acting like a bell, and it starts getting a harmonic in there, and you can hear it in the vehicle. And one of the things you can do is add a little bit of weight there to that axle end. Maybe balanced weights might do it for you. Uh, you might have to go to just a heavier wheel. That's one thing you can look at is having a little bit more weight on that axle end to get those harmonics taken care of. Bit of a funny story on that. Well, I think it's a funny story. I was in the automotive uh, field for 15 plus years and working with some high end uh, car manufacturers. And, you know, we're always talking about making the lightest wheel possible. And they're like, no, we don't want the lightest wheel possible. We want the quietest wheel possible for the vehicles they were building. And like you said, to get out of some of the modal issues, which really are not uh, balance concerns, those get into the the, the runouts and the harmonics that we were talking about earlier, but they would make their wheels heavier and heavier so that they would not have to run into any harmonic issues. You don't see that. You don't need that on a commercial vehicle or a class three and above, but in situations, like you said, with a, a motorhome, someone who's very sensitive driving down the road, it may come into play. Dave, you want to talk a little bit about what fleets do out there, what you're seeing in the field when it comes to balance? Again, I, I, I'm just kind of generalizing but most fleets will say if it's within 10 ounces of balance we're good to go you know so they put the tire wheel they run it around they run it around on their balancer if it's within 10 hey we're good to go it's so weird when you watch them because they know what where tire life is and they understand that and you say okay this is what they do now 
at TMC, we, we put like maxes on everything. So we put a max of 14 ounces on the steers and we put a max of 18 ounces on the drives. And again, that's just a guideline. But you see fleets, when they get the tire wheel assembly, if it's below 10, they're like good to go. They, they're like, hey, we're not going to mess around with waiting this and doing all this. Again, I, I think it, everything is time is money in that business. And the more you understand what they're trying to do, it's practical. I mean, they're trying to get that tire wheel is, is you know, hey, it's that's pretty good. Let's go. As long as the driver doesn't complain, everybody's happy. So we're going to talk about the different kinds of balancing. We have there's external balancing and there's internal balancing. Let's start with external balancing. Doug, you want to talk a little bit about that? We've mentioned it a little bit already. That's what I was saying about stick-on weights or clip-on weights. When we're talking about doing the actual balancing, obviously you need to add weight somewhere to counteract the out-of-balance situation. And so most of the time uh, it'll be done externally with clip-on weights. Uh, specifically here in, in North America, the wheels are designed with a TAL, we'll call it, uh, balance weight flange, which accepts the TAL balance weight. That is fairly standard in North America. Those are typically coated. And then when I say the TAL, that's for an aluminum wheel. Um, you'd have an I7 flange for a steel wheel, which would take the appropriate uh, weight for that as well. And for the aluminum wheel, you want to have it coated uh, so you don't create a, a, a corrosion issue. Uh, you can go with uncoated uh, for the steel wheel. Uh, they're painted. And to apply them, uh, those, are, again, are, they're knocked on, we'll call it. So it has a, a teeth on it. You stick it on the flange, you whack it, and those teeth basically hold it in place. Uh, another way of doing it was some people don't want to damage their wheels, specifically on aluminum wheels. They don't want to, maybe you can see the balance weight. You can use stick-on weights, and those can be applied onto the rim more easily. And it's just an adhesive. And in that situation, you really want to clean that area well. Uh, you want to make sure that it's a, a dry, clean surface, just like you would for any, you know, putting a tape on anything. You want to make sure you've got the best surface possible for the adhesion to stay and for it to stick long term. And so those would be two ways that it's done from uh, on the wheel perspective. And then they're also what they call uh, balance rings that are out there. And they're a separate component uh, that can be, um, used, typically it's a, uh, Go, it would be, go between the duels. They do have them for steers as well. And they would go onto the bolt circle just as you would a regular wheel. It would be part of the whole stack up of the, the wheel uh, on top of the hub, and you would bolt that all together. And that's one thing you got to be careful of of those is, again, you have an extra surface now that has come between uh, the wheel and the hub. And the more surfaces you have, the more opportunity you have for um, torque loss and mismounting opportunities. So you've got to be careful of that as well. And Dave, you probably have some input on those in the field too. On clip-on weights, ever since radial tires, which it's really odd that, you know, again, we're a little more older than most people because some of the <laughs> younger listeners would say, what do you mean what was before? There used to be a biased tire, believe it or not, and they didn't flex, they, you know, very solid. Ever since the onslaught of radials, because they flex so great, to technically to put a clip-on balance weight on correctly, you run it through the spin balancer, you see where the weight needs to go, you actually have to reduce the air pressure in the tire by 50%, beat on the weight, air it back up, and run it again. As we keep saying, time is money. Most people don't do it the correct way. A lot of clip-on balance weights are falling off in the field. And that is true. <laughs> so a lot of fleets don't want to use clip-on weights because technically to get them on and to stay on, they have to reduce that air pressure in that tire and let that radial come back up so you can actually beat them on and, and, and get them to stay on. And then, believe it or not, when you air it back up, the radial is actually going to help you keep that clip-on weight in spot. So... There's one thing about that. Stick-on weights, we talked about. The big thing about stick-on weights is, is getting a clean surface. Everybody says, well, where do I put the, I can't put the stick-on weights. Where do I put them? Well, you put them closest to the edge, to the, uh, the two edges or towards the disc. 
Sometimes you might have brake drum clearance issues because the brake drum might be as close, or you might have a, a rotor or something in the disc brake. So you really have to make sure when you're putting a stick on a plate, is it going to interfere with the brake drum or is it going to interfere with the rotor? And that will take them off really quick. So, uh, you know, these are some of the things to look for. That's why, again, those two types, balancing rings, where I see them most is on motorhomes. It goes on before you put the wheel on, so you put the brake drum on, or you got the disc brake, you put the balancing rings, you put the wheel on, and basically the balls and the, you know, the balancing rings, they go around and around, and it's kind of like the harmonics. It's kind of smoothing out the, the ride, and some people love them, and other people don't see any difference. So that's kind of my opinion on those. Well, why don't you keep on going, Dave, and talk to us a little bit about the internal balancing technologies that are out there. Oh, boy. These are subjects that move. I, yeah, I knew you had opinions on this, so I'll tee that up for you. Internal balancing. They're, and, again, what I'm going to state, this is my opinion and my personal opinion. There's powders, or we call them granules, and then there's liquid internal balancers. And I have been to fleets that say they're the greatest things in the world, and I've been to fleets that say, boy, this is really terrible. So it's, again, it's on their own experience. I'll tell you what maintenance issues that you need to look for. On the powders and granules, you need a filter valve stem, because if you check the air pressure, these powders or granules try to come up and uh, come out of the tire just like air does. So you have to have a filtered valve stem. If you use too much lubrication when you mount the tire and that lube balls this stuff up, you're going to have a real thumping issue because it kind of bonds this stuff up and then it goes thump, thump, thump. The other thing about these powders and granule stuff is they put a bag of it in, the bag kind of melts away, you know, disintegrates. So it's always in the tire and wheels. So when you're taking it off, you better understand that you have powder or granule because most people reuse them. Liquids. Oh, boy. First thing, I, if I was a operator, is check to see if that liquid is going to do something to your wheel. There are ones that I've seen in the field that will eat right through aluminum. There are ones that will take off every bit of paint on that steel wheel. You know, so try to understand what they're doing. And as a liquid sealant or as a liquid uh, balancer, they basically go around kind of what the powders and the granules do. And as again, some fleets love them, some don't. But try to understand. And again, understand in the liquids, that stuff's going into the valve stem. So when you check air, that stuff could basically clog your valve stem and do that. So again, they tell you to use a filtered stem. So these are the things that I know are kind of in the field. Doug, you want to talk a little bit about the regulations that we see coming down the pipe? For, for lead weights, um, yeah, there's, it's already happened in the uh, past car light truck uh, industry. The, they've outlawed lead uh, in balance weights, and so the uh, you know, stick-on or even knock-on weights, they've had to go to uh, different uh, materials. Uh, steel weights are, are, are used a fair bit now in uh, past car light truck, and so it is um, something that I believe is going to be coming to uh, the commercial vehicle, uh, they're trying to get rid of lead everywhere they can. And so that would probably be the main thing to to be aware of. Obviously, when you go from uh, the lead, which has such beautiful density for what we're doing, uh, and go to any other material, you end up having a much larger weight. And so that obviously changes the look. It changes how you have to ad adhere it and the strength you need to hold it in place. It's going over a larger distance. And then that's one of the other, I guess, issues that you run into with balance weights is you need multiple sizes for multiple wheel sizes as well so that they'll fit properly. And I guess as another to your point, Dave, one of the, the headaches of, of balancing if you choose to balance. But uh, that would be the main thing with, with uh, regulations is the, the lead weights having to move to a, a steel or other material. And a lot of the ones I see in the commercial ones are liquid. And the liquid ones, as Doug pointed out, they're much larger. 
than you know the old stick-ons and clip-on lead ones. So that's the biggest issue. You got something a lot bigger when you go into a liquid balance weight. Right. Yeah, you know, there's all sorts of things you hear out there, people trying to cheat the system and using all sorts of crazy stuff uh, to, to do that balancing. They don't want to spend the money for the powders. You know, they think that they can come up with some sort of solution on their own. Dave, you've probably seen more of that than any of us. What are some of your favorites? Top of my list would be golf balls. When those guys say, well, I put golf balls in there, and that's what, if you realize what a golf ball is doing in, inside that tire wheel bouncing around, it's hilarious because that's kind of one of our jokes in and I'll, I'll mention them by name because I have to, but Bridgestone makes golf balls and tires. If it's a Bridgestone <laughs> golf ball, I guess it's okay, right? Because you know, Bridgestone guys don't like when we always say, well, as long as it's a Bridgestone golf ball, they're they're made to do that. But that's a wise tell, and people will tell you, oh, it works. Well, I'm telling you, you're going to damage a tire and wheel more than what you ever think. Encasing life in that tire is so important. Just try to understand what that ball bouncing around, you know, hitting the wheel tire, bouncing in there. So golf balls is number one. The second one that I've seen and heard of is marbles. They take marbles and they throw it in there because they're cheaper than this other stuff. And they're like, oh, it's, it works great. Well, again. Cheaper than golf balls. It's cheaper than golf balls. It's cheaper. And it's cheaper than, you know, some of the powders and granules. And you're like. But the little things hitting everything, you know what I mean? That's not what you want. And then the other one that I love was antifreeze. They would put antifreeze in there because it doesn't free. It's like a liquid. But antifreeze and tires hate each other. <laughs> so you're basically ruining your tires. But, uh, you know, I got to say there's a lot of uh, people will try anything. But when you're talking the cost of a tire in commercial trucks, I would not recommend using any of these three things that I've just brought up. As always, and we can't say it enough, you know, follow the manufacturer's recommendations. As engineers, as experts in the field, I can promise you we put a lot of thought into the guidance that we give you isn't just made up. This is a lot of thought trying to get the most performance for you. And yes, we're, we are concerned about your costs too, but we're not trying to get you to buy stuff. We're trying to take care of you when we put that guidance out there. Well, I think that about does it. Hey, thank you again for joining us on this episode of Behind the Wheels. We'll be back next time. Sponsored by Alcoa Wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation, manufacturing, and technology. Inventing the first forged aluminum wheel in 1948, its team of experts continue to develop the most lightweight, efficient, and high-performing commercial vehicle aluminum wheel products bringing you revolutionary innovations like Alcoa Durabright wheels, Alcoa Dura Black wheels, the new Alcoa wheels hub board technology, and the lightest truck wheel on the market, Alcoa Ultra One 22 and a half by eight and a quarter wheel. Alcoa wheels, the global leader in aluminum wheel innovation.